Does the Bible contain an animal welfare ethic? Many passages in the Bible are typically understood as teaching an explicit ethic of care and concern for animals and the environment. Deuteronomy 22, 6-7 says young birds may be taken from their mother for food, but their mother must be left alone. Leviticus 22:28 says an ox or sheep is not to be slaughtered on the same day as their young. Exodus 23:5 and Deuteronomy 25:4 say animals used commercially are not to be overburdened or exploited. Proverbs 12:10 says a righteous man takes care of his animals. However, biblical scholar Cyril Rod challenged such readings of the Bible in his work Glimpses of a Strange Land, Studies in Old Testament Ethics, published in 2001. He proposed that not only are biblical ethics radically different to those of our era, but also that the original writers of the Bible and the societies in which they lived shared little or none of the ethical concerns of the modern age. Specifically, Rod claimed that, quote, the Bible is mined for texts which support current ecological concern, end quote, which he declared, quote, is a very late development, end quote. In his view, instead of Christians leading the way in ecological care, quote, the reality is that the Christian church has at last almost caught up with the secular world, end quote. Rod insisted that the Bible does not contain a distinctive animal welfare ethic and presented revisionist readings of passages which have typically been understood as illustrating ethical concern for animals. In Rod's view, quote, support in the Bible for a more enlightened ethic of animal welfare has demanded a highly selective approach, end quote, adding, quote, the teaching of the Bible is highly ambiguous, end quote. This video subjects Rod's arguments to critical scrutiny, covering these topics. Firstly, animal ethics in the law of Moses. Secondly, animal ethics in the wisdom literature and prophets. Thirdly, the animal ethics of Israel's neighbors. Fourthly, does the Bible sanction animal cruelty? Fifthly, is a biblical animal welfare ethic an anachronistic reading? Animals in the law of Moses. Rod claims there is no evidence that the seventh-day rest for animals, commanded in both Exodus 20.10 and Deuteronomy 5.14, indicates a concern for their welfare, instead seeing this law as merely the general application of a religiously motivated cessation of work to please God. In Rod's view, quote, it seems to be going beyond the evidence to suggest that any concern for the well-being of the animals lies behind this Sabbath law in either version even though we may today interpret it in this way, end quote. However, the explicit reason given in the commandment recorded in Exodus is, quote, so that your male and female servants, like yourself, may have rest, end quote. The rationale for the commandment, therefore, is that servants must enjoy the same rest as their masters. There is no indication that the reason for extending the Sabbath rest to servants and animals is to please God, or to gain his favor in some way. On the contrary, the stated reason is to provide a physical benefit for all who have served during the week. Curiously, however, Rod later acknowledges that at least the commandment in Exodus 20.10 to give rest to beasts of burden on the Sabbath indicates a, quote, genuine concern, end quote, for their welfare. Similarly, citing the requirement that an animal of the herd to be sacrificed must first spend seven days with its mother, Rod acknowledges that one of the earliest Jewish interpretations of this passage, by Philo of Alexandria in the first century, understood this as a humanitarian act out of compassion for the animal's mother. Nevertheless, Rod rejects this reading and claims the commandment is motivated by concerns for ritual purity, writing, quote, It seems more likely that the restriction was related to the ritual impurity associated with birth. End quote. However, Rod omits to place this law within the context of other laws in the Bible relating to the treatment of animal mothers with their children, laws which demonstrate a clear, compassionate motivation.
Jewish scholar Naam Sana writes, quote, This law may also reflect the desire to avoid cruelty to animals and, more broadly, to foster humane feelings in human beings. End quote. Sana notes that this is, quote, suggested by mention of the mother and by extension of the Levitical law to include a prohibition on slaughtering both the young and its mother on the same day, end quote, and cites passages such as Deuteronomy 22, 6 to 7, which prohibits taking eggs or baby birds from a nest protected by its mother, Deuteronomy 22, 10, which prohibits harnessing an ox and a donkey on a cart together, and Deuteronomy 15, 4, which prevents muzzling an ox to prevent it eating while working. In the context of these laws, especially within the same chapter or context, it is natural to understand the law which kept the mother and the animal to be sacrificed together for seven days as likewise humanely motivated. Citing the law which prohibits the ox to be muzzled when treading the corn, Rod acknowledges it is difficult to interpret this commandment as anything but a demonstration of compassion. He says this can, quote, hardly have any other force than to oppose the cruelty of preventing the ox from eating any of the corn that is at its feet, end quote. Yet Rod then insists that this was, quote, a unique example of sympathy for animals, end quote, in the law of Moses, dismissing the idea that the purpose behind the law prohibiting the harness of an ox or donkey, quote, is to safeguard the weaker donkey, end quote. However, Rod's claim that the law against yoking an ox and donkey together does not reflect concern for animal welfare is asserted without any evidence at all. In contrast, the socio-historical context informs us that such an action was considered unwise at least and unfair at most by other cultures even before Israel was a nation. The Sumerian law code known as the Reforms of Uru Inimjina written during the reign of King Uru Inimjina, 2351 to 2342 BCE, lists a number of social evils which prompted the king to revise the legislative code. One of those evils is described as, quote, the Sanger priests hitched goring oxen to the donkey teams, end quote, indicating that pairing the ox and the donkeys on the same team was considered a high state of disorder if not explicitly ethically astray. So there is evidence that people at the time of the law of Moses would have understood that harnessing a donkey and an ox together to pull the same cart was unfair to the weaker animal. Consequently, Rabbi and Jewish theologian Dan Cohen Sherbock writes, quote, specific legislation was also invoked to ensure that animals should be protected from harm in a wide range of circumstances so as to ensure that, in cases where animals were yoked together, Deuteronomy 22.10 prohibits the harnessing together of a strong and weak animal. End quote. A number of Rod's other arguments are similarly lacking in evidence. He claims that the law which commanded the Hebrews not to take the eggs from a brooding mother, or to take the mother with the young but to let the mother go, Deuteronomy 22.6-7, would not have been originally understood as ensuring the species would survive. He writes, quote, It would, of course, assist the maintenance of the species, but this is hardly an idea current in the time of the collector of the laws. End quote. Rod then points to confusion among the early and later medieval rabbis as to exactly what this law meant. But this is not evidence that the law would not have been understood by the original audience as contributing to the perpetuation of the species. The rationale given in this passage actually contradicts Rod's assertion since it states explicitly that the purpose of the law is, quote, so that it may go well with you and you may have a long life, end quote. Although it would be too much to say this is explicitly stating that the obedient Hebrew's life would be extended on the basis of having provided enough food for the future through the responsible management of local animal resources, this was nevertheless how the passage was understood by other medieval rabbis, whom Rod does not mention. Biblical scholar Jeffrey Tige cites the interpretation of the medieval rabbi Abravanel. Tige says that Abravanel really did interpret this passage as a reference to animal conservation. He writes, quote, To Abravanel, the promise of a long life signals an additional aim of the law, conservation of natural resources. Releasing the mother enables her to produce more offspring in the future, 
and thus helps maintain the supply of food needed by humans. End quote. In addition to this concern, Tigay points out the very obvious fact, even more closely related to animal welfare, that, quote, what the text finds callous are the acts themselves, end quote, even regardless of future consequences. Similarly, Dan Cohen Sherbock writes, quote, such kindness towards the beast of the field is to be extended to other creatures. Thus, Deuteronomy states that birds, too, must be treated with mercy, end quote. Rod does grant that the Sabbath rest for animals in Exodus 2010, quote, appears to reflect a genuine concern for the draft animals, end quote. However, he nevertheless denies that this is the intent of the same law in Deuteronomy 5.14. Animals in the Wisdom Literature and Prophets Rod has a more positive view of animal welfare concerns expressed in the Wisdom Literature, the books of Psalms, Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, and in the books of the Prophets. For example, he acknowledges the force of Proverbs 12.10, which reads, A righteous person cares for the life of his animal, but even the most compassionate acts of the wicked are cruel. Rod accepts that this verse, quote, is generally taken to teach caring for one's animals, end quote. Certainly, this is probably the strongest of the Bible's animal welfare statements, since the Hebrew word for righteous here is used to identify an individual of the highest moral standard who is well favoured by God. The full force of this proverb is that the quality of a person's character can be identified by the way they treat their domestic animals, which places a remarkably high value on animal welfare. Consequently, Rod concedes, quote, it seems probable that a genuine concern for domestic animals is expressed here, end quote. Similarly, Rod has a positive view of the later prophets, identifying Isaiah 52, Jeremiah 14, 5-6, and Joel 1, 18, as all demonstrating compassion for animals. Nevertheless, he tries to mitigate the force of these passages by commenting, quote, they are unusual in the Old Testament, end quote. However, there is another relevant passage in the prophets which Rod does not cite. When God rebukes the prophet Jonah for his failure to feel compassion on the city of Nineveh, the fate of the innocent animals in the city is cited as one of the reasons why God spared it. In Jonah 4 verse 11, God says, Should I not be even more concerned about Nineveh, this enormous city? There are more than 120,000 people in it who do not know right from wrong, as well as many animals. Biblical scholar Uriel Simon writes, quote, here, the Lord himself unequivocally states that he must care also for the masses of children and beasts who had not transgressed. End quote. Animal Ethics of Israel's Neighbors Unlike the animal welfare commandments in the Hebrew Bible, there was no comparable legislation among Israel's neighbors. The Sumerian law code cited previously includes, quote, hitched goring oxen to the donkey teams, end quote, in a description of wrongs. However, this comment occurs in a list of woes intended to describe the age before the current king as one of disorder. The fact that other wrongs listed include, quote, the oxen of the gods plowed the onion patch of the ruler, end quote, indicates that this is a generic list of things which ought not to be, rather than actual illegal acts. Consequently, although the text indicates this was understood to be a state of disorder and possibly understood to be ethically wrong, there is no evidence for any law which actually prohibited hitching goring oxen to donkeys. In fact, the laws of Israel's Mesopotamian neighbors contained no animal welfare protection and Mesopotamian society treated animals as objects. It was common for rulers to gather massive collections of animals for the purpose of demonstrating their wealth even to the extent of driving local species to extinction. Dr. Stevenson Chad Bostock notes that, quote, indigenous large animals were becoming scarce through overhunting or collecting, end quote. He also describes how the Assyrians would confine captured wild animals within a very small area, guarded by soldiers, in order to hunt them for sport. This was a privilege typically reserved for kings. Bostock observes with some pathos, quote, it is striking how the Assyrian sculptors of 
say lions and deer, are magnificently lifelike, yet so often of wounded, suffering animals. End quote. These large scale slaughters were considered praiseworthy and were listed among the greatest deeds of the kings. The Armant Stella of Tutmos III of Egypt describes Pharaoh Tutmos hunting for recreation and records that Tutmos once killed 12 wild bulls in an hour and 120 elephants in another hunt. Even leaving room for exaggeration, it is clear that the casual killing of animals on such a scale was seen as admirable. In contrast, there is no hint in the historical record of the Hebrew kings or nobles hunting animals for sport. Does the Bible sanction animal cruelty? One passage in scripture is notable for its specific condemnation of an act of cruelty towards animals. And again, it is a passage Rod does not cite. In Genesis chapter 49 verses 5 to 6, the patriarch Jacob denounces his sons Simeon and Levi for their violence, accusing them in particular of having hamstrung oxen for sport. Hamstringing the oxen would have involved cutting the Achilles tendon in one or more of their legs, which would render them lame. This would either cripple them for life, in the case of one leg, or at worst render them totally unable to stand, in the case of two or three legs, which would lead to their death due to incapacitation. This passage is important not only for revealing Jacob's disgust for his son's cruelty to animals, but also because it demonstrates that the writer, living long after Jacob, since he records Jacob's death, shared Jacob's disgust. He has recorded Simeon and Levi's actions and condemned them as shameful for the, eth for the ethical instruction of later generations. However, this passage is also important for the serious ethical issue it raises with other passages of Scripture. In the book of Joshua, chapter 11, verses 6 and 9, God explicitly instructs Joshua to hamstring the horses of his defeated enemies, and Joshua obediently carries this out. Later on, of his own accord, King David does the same to almost all of the chariot horses he captures from King Hadadezer of Zobar as recorded in 2 Samuel 8.4 and 1 Chronicles 18.4. In the case of David, at least, the argument could be made that God himself did not issue the commandment to hamstring the horses, but this does not explain why David thought it acceptable and why the narrator mentions it without condemnatory comment. In the case of Joshua, it is God himself who issued the commandment, presenting a significant challenge. How is it that God could command an action which was clearly viewed as cruel by the typical moral standards of the average Hebrew? Curiously, Rod does not cite this passage either, suggesting he may be aware of the fact that it does not provide an example of divinely sanctioned cruelty to animals. The answer lies in the difference between Simeon and Levi's action and the actions of Joshua and David. In the case of Simeon and Levi, Oxen were hamstrung for pleasure. This was the deliberate, cruel crippling of animals for sport. However, in the case of Joshua and David, the motive was different, and therefore the method of hamstringing was different. There are two ways of hamstringing a horse. One damages the Achilles tendons of the rear legs, making it impossible for the horse to walk or even stand, which typically results in their death. However, the other damages just one front flexor tendon, making it impossible for the horse to gallop, but preserving its ability to stand, walk, and perform labor. Whereas Simeon and Levi crippled oxen permanently for sport, Joshua and David only rendered chariot horses useless for warfare, and the method they used to do this did not cripple the animal or make it lame. In a biography of King David entitled David's Secret Demons, Messiah, Murderer, Traitor, King, published in 2011, Jewish archaeologist and historian Baruch Halpern depicts David in extremely unfavorable terms, characterizing him as a liar, murderer, traitor, and insurrectionist who rose to power through a combination of military skill, cunning, treachery, propaganda, and skillful political maneuvering. Nevertheless, when discussing David's hamstringing of chariot horses, surprisingly, Halpin does not seize on the act as an example of David's cruelty and lack of ethics. Instead, 
help and identifies David's actions as motivated by practicality rather than viciousness, and also explains that in this case the animals were not crippled, but only had their mobility reduced. Halpern writes, quote, A simple incision damaging a single front flexor tendon, a superficial ligament on the lower part of the horse's leg, would prevent a horse from running by making it impossible to lift the front leg, end quote. Adding, quote, At the same time, the animal would be fit to walk and breed and would retain the capacity to serve for draft work, end quote. So Halpern, with no motivation to present David in a favourable light, is objectively reading the text in its socio-historical context. His explanation of the text demonstrates his awareness that the expensive war horses of a defeated enemy would not be crippled or lamed by the victor. In Halpern's view, David was deliberately limiting his own chariot forces, possibly to prevent their use in a military coup and also because he was unable or unwilling to maintain a large mercenary chariot contingent himself. As Halpern explains it, David would not have had enough charioteers to incorporate all the chariot horses into his army, and would therefore have taken in the horses and chariots with their foreign drivers, whom he would have paid as mercenary forces, a risky decision given the uncertain loyalty of mercenaries. Halpern also notes that David only hamstrung the horses which were trained for chariotry, not the horses used for cavalry. This demonstrates David's motive was not cruelty or senseless violence, and that he did not inflict more harm than was necessary. In Halpern's view, the horses which were hamstrung, quote, were likely put to some other peaceable use, probably in agriculture and haulage, but especially breeding, end quote. Is an animal welfare ethic an anachronistic reading? Rod claims that animal welfare readings of the Bible are, quote, a very late development, end quote. He argues that such readings are a modern invention, arising as a response to comparatively recent environmental concerns. In this section, we'll test his claim. It is true that the early Christian writings on passages in the Bible which addressed human relationships to animals and the environment contain a mixture of viewpoints. One is the ecocentric viewpoint, in which animals and plants are seen as having intrinsic value and are consequently respected on the basis of that value. Another is the anthropocentric viewpoint, in which animals and plants have extrinsic value insofar as they are of benefit to humans. Of course, these two viewpoints are not mutually exclusive, and some Christian commentators have seen animals and plants as having both intrinsic and extrinsic value. But it is fair to say that early Christians expressed both ecocentric positions and anthropocentric Hellenistic views unfavourable to the environment. If Rod's overall argument was true, we would expect to find arguments in the early Christian literature which showed disregard for animal welfare, or which demonstrate they did not interpret the Bible as presenting an animal welfare ethic. So let's test Rod's claim by checking how the early Christian commentators understood some of these biblical texts, including those Rod himself has cited. If Rod is correct, we should not find any evidence for interpretations supporting an animal welfare ethic. Our first text is Exodus chapter 23, verse 5. Quote, If you see the donkey of someone who hates you fallen under its load, you must not ignore him, but be sure to help him with it. End quote. Writing in the 4th century, Clement of Alexandria says, quote, The Lord tells us to relieve and lighten the burden of beasts of burden, even when they belong to our enemies. End quote. He then draws from this the lesson that we are not to take pleasure in the misfortunes of others or laugh at our enemies. In the 4th to 5th centuries, Caesarius of Alexandria says, quote, You are commanded to pull out the ass or the ox which is lying in the mud. End quote. From this, he argues that Christians ought to help other Christians who are spiritually weak and in trouble. It must be understood that neither Clement nor Caesarius are allegorizing the text. They are not saying the text seems to be speaking of helping a literal animal in distress, but is actually intended to mean not laughing at enemies or helping fellow Christians. On the contrary, they are arguing for an extended application of the text on the basis that it really means what it says. This was common of the early Christian commentators who wrote on the animal welfare texts in the Bible. 
their acknowledgement of the fact that the text really was commanding care for animals allowed them to build on that fact and apply the principle of the text to other contexts. Typically, these commentators made two arguments. One, since God commanded humans to care for animals, humans should take care of each other. Two, caring for animals has the positive result of developing a compassionate character. It is important to note that such applications of these texts would have been impossible if they had not understood the texts as literally commanding care for animals. Our next text is Leviticus chapter 22, verse 29. Quote, You must not slaughter an ox or a sheep and its young on the same day. End quote. Writing in the 2nd century, Clement of Alexandria says that since, quote, milk flows in the mothers for the nourishment of the offspring, then in taking the offspring away from the providential endowment of the milk, a person is doing violence to nature, end quote. This is an explicit animal welfare interpretation, stating that denying the mother's milk to its offspring is, quote, doing violence to nature, end quote. Having acknowledged the literal meaning of the text, Clement then applies it further in an attack on the pagan practice of leaving unwanted newborn children out in the wild to die. Clement writes, quote, Yet some people actually expose human offspring to abortive death, end quote, and notes that if the law of Moses refused to even allow the separation of young animals from their young, the law is obviously showing how wrong it is to dispose of unwanted infants by leaving them to die. Our next text is Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 10. Quote, you must not plow with an ox and a donkey harnessed together. End quote. Writing in the second century, Clement of Alexandria says that the reason for this law is probably, quote, the disparity between the animals, end quote, indicating he believed it was motivated by concern for animal welfare. Extraordinarily, Clement then drew an anti-racist interpretation from the text, saying, quote, It is, at the same time, showing clearly that we must not wrong any of those from other races by bringing them under the same yoke when we have nothing against them apart from their foreignness, for which they are not responsible, which is not an immoral tray, and does not spring from one. End quote. Our next text is Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 4. Quote, you must not muzzle your ox when it is treading grain. End quote. Writing in the third century, Oregon interprets this commandment both ecocentrically and anthropocentrically, writing, quote, God's care was not only for the oxen, but more so for the apostles, for whose sake he uttered these words. End quote. In the fourth century, John Chrysostom gave the same interpretation, writing, quote, If God cares about oxen, how much more will he care about the labor of teachers? End quote. Again, the application of the law to humans is only possible by acknowledging the law's intent to command the literal care of animals. Our next text is Proverbs chapter 22, verse 10. Quote, A righteous person cares for the life of his animal. End quote. Writing in the 4th century, John Chrysostom argues that one of the intended functions of this law is that by caring for animals, people develop compassion for others. He says, quote, Indeed, he who has pity upon animals tends to have much more pity upon his brothers. End quote. He explains the argument in detail, writing, quote, Do the righteous have pity upon the souls of their animals? Absolutely. Certainly, it is necessary to convey benevolence towards them, so that there may be a greater exercise of benevolence towards fellow human beings, end quote. Summarizing his argument, Chrysostom says, quote, Indeed, with good reason, God ordered that we carry hurt animals and take back those that stray, and not to bind the mouth of an ox. He absolutely wants us to preserve the health of animals, in the first place for our sake, second, in order that they may provide us with their menial service, end quote. Our last text is Jonah chapter 4, verse 11. Here God says, quote, Should I not be even more concerned about Nineveh, this enormous city? There are more than 120,000 people in it who do not know right from wrong, as well as many animals. End quote. 
writing in the 4th century, Ephraim the Syrian says that the purpose of this statement by God was so that the king of Nineveh, to whom God's prophet Jonah was sent, quote, might come to know the providence of God toward all creatures, even toward horses and mules, end quote. Later adding, quote, God showed this same benevolence of his goodwill and indulgence toward animals, end quote. In other words, Ephraim views this declaration by God as being motivated explicitly by God's desire to show a pagan king how much he, God, cared for animals. This is already sufficient evidence to demonstrate that animal welfare readings of these passages are by no means a modern innovation. They were transparently obvious to the early Christian commentators who not only recognized their relevance to human-animal relations, but also drew from them important lessons about ethical behavior between humans. Also contrary to Rod's claim of anachronism is the fact that the law of Moses' ethic of compassion for living beings and concern for the environment was recognized and discussed in detail during the early rabbinic era of the first centuries after Jesus. From this ethic, the rabbis drew two principles, one of conservation and avoidance of waste, and one of animal welfare. The principle of conservation is called Baal Tachit, which insists that both the natural world and all things derived from it for human use must be used in a way which avoids waste and unnecessary destruction. The principle of animal welfare is called Saba Alei Chaim, the suffering of all living creatures. This principle insists that all living creatures must be treated in such a way as to avoid suffering, or at least minimize suffering, when it is unavoidable. Even Rod acknowledges that this rabbinical principle was drawn directly from the animal welfare commandments of the law of Moses, specifically from the passage Deuteronomy chapter 22, verses 1 to 4. Rod writes, quote, In Judaism, it was the basis of the Talmudic principle called the duty of relieving suffering of living beings. End quote. Once they had been derived directly from the law of Moses, the principles of Baal Tachid and Tzab Alechim were articulated and developed further by later medieval Jewish commentators. Dan Cohen Sherbock writes, quote, Following biblical teaching, the rabbis stressed the need for animal welfare. All living beings are part of God's creation and therefore require special consideration. End quote. He also adds, quote, such sensitivity to animal welfare is reflected in a number of incidents in which the rabbis expressed kindness to God's creatures. End quote. So, far from being a modern reinterpretation of an ancient text, the animal welfare ethic of the Law of Moses is inextricably part of the original message and was clearly accessible and seen and explicated by some of its earliest Jewish and Christian interpreters. Conclusion Contrary to the criticisms of Cyril Rod, the Bible maintains a consistently high standard of animal welfare ethics. This concern for animal welfare was inherited by both early Jewish commentary and early Christian commentary, from whence it was transmitted into later Christian thought. Although the history of Christianity demonstrates that this ethic was substantially lost or obscured by Christians for several centuries, its revival was, nevertheless, the result of renewed interest in scriptural ethical teaching on the subject, rather than concession to secular concerns.